Okay, uh, great. I want to first thank the organizers for organizing this wonderful uh, conference and for having me here. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to, to be able to talk here. And I wanted to begin with, of course, congratulating uh, Sriram um, for his illustrious career and his birthday. And I didn't have any personal photos of Sriram, so here's a painting I gifted him yesterday. Um, so happy 66th birthday. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I first met Sri Ram as a graduate student and had, uh, uh, it was a great opportunity to work with him uh, on, on several problems in active liquid crystals and defects, uh, none of which I will tell you about today. Uh, but I want to go back to, of course, a paper that's been referenced many, many times uh, in this conference already on you know, one of his landmark uh, works on looking at the impact and importance of hydrodynamics and, and fluid flows in active suspensions. And so there's been a lot of focus on wet active fluids. And I want to tell you a little bit about what, uh, in some work that we've been doing, in asking what happens in the context of wet active solids. Um, and so that's going to be the content of my talk today. Um, and so what do I mean by wet active solids? And uh, when I say a little bit, I want to tell you a little bit about physics in, of these systems, but also, uh, contextualize this in a biological context and say, what can we use and how can we use uh, some of these ideas of active matter physics in solid systems uh, to understand some potentially um, important uh, features of physiology. Um, so water, of course, is the largest component by volume uh, of all of our cells. Um, and oftentimes, we don't think about the movement and dynamics of water within cells as being really uh, relevant for its motility and morphology, but um, it does play a role. And, and one place where we know a lot about water movements driving motion is, of course, in plants. You know, they drive fast motions, particularly uh, through hydraulic movements of water through hydrated tissues and cells. Uh, most, one of the more famous ones being the snapping of the Venus flytrap. In animals, of course, we have muscles to go around and do our things, including motion and behavior. Um, and I want to suggest and ask and think about um, what is the role of the water within muscle fibers? And is there, um, is there a way to think about, in a coarse grain sense, of uh, muscle as a soft, active, and hydraulic engine? Uh, and what are the consequences of thinking of muscle as essentially and what's in the title, a wet active solid. So it's not just a collection of molecules, but it's a, a, a solid matrix of uh, actomyosin sitting inside uh, a membrane. Uh, and all of this is immersed in a fluid, which is cytosol. And the combined dynamics of all of these things, what, are, what does it, uh, how does it constrain physiological properties and mechanics and dynamics of muscle? And for the details, uh, of the work. Uh, there's a preprint if you're interested. Uh, this is work that I did with Al Mahadevan when I was uh, still at Harvard until a few months ago. And I'm currently at the University of Michigan. Um, okay, so uh, I want to perhaps begin with a broad uh, question uh, and sort of taking a step back, which is if we if you want to think about the range and limits of motion of uh, muscle-driven movements, um, no, let's look around in the natural world. What's the spread of, of the kinds of things that muscle-driven movements uh, can accomplish? And one of the most uh, remarkable uh, spread of uh, features is in the rates of, uh, uh, of such movements. So there are ex some extremely fast movements that are driven by muscle. In us, it's uh, the fastest movements are on the 10 hertz time scales, which are eye movements. But uh, in sound production, in snakes and insects, but also most remarkably in flight, particularly in insect flight, you see extremely rapid movements, almost on the ranges of uh, you know, milliseconds or hundreds of her uh, thousands of hertz uh, time scales of um, muscle-driven sort of uh, wing beats. And in many of these examples, particularly in small insects, including mosquitoes and bees, uh, these movements are not regulated and dictated directly by the neurons or by calcium that is cycling. And in many of these cases, uh, the muscle is contracting at, at rates that are much faster than the neurons can control. And so there is a uh, natural question is that uh, 
First of all, there's this widespread of, of, um, of rates of contraction. Can we make sense of it? Can we understand it? What are the parameters that we should think about in terms of going from you know, the slow to the fast and the fastest? Um, and if the neurons and the calcium cycling that is eventually upstream of uh, uh, the, the controlling of, of uh, um, uh, muscular contraction, if that's not the primary rate limiting step, then what are the bustle intrinsic uh, rate limiting steps and what are the biophysical principles of that? And for this, um, as I, I'm sure all of us would appreciate, uh, perhaps we should go just beyond thinking about the molecular kinetics and is there a coarse-grained effective mesoscale description uh, that integrates the, uh, the properties of uh, the molecular all the way up to the, the fiber properties. And so this is the sort of large scale uh, set of questions that I want to try to at least start on uh, trying to get and handle over and uh, provide you with a construction of at least w uh, one model uh, which tries to do some of this and, and demonstrate some of the consequences for physiology, particularly in the context of rapid movements. Uh, okay, so um, in a coarse, uh, at, at, at a coarse grained level, you know, one of the things again that we all uh, sort of intuitively know and also appreciate uh, just in terms of how um, biology of cells are, um, muscle like every other cell is extremely complicated and it's extremely complex in terms of its organization. It's ex very hierarchical, it's very multi-scale, you have um, filaments of actin and myosin, which form essentially a very well-ordered crystalline lattice. Um, and, and those structures are all essentially on the micron scale, but individual fibers of muscles, which are multinucleated, long, slender uh, fibers, can be very large. And some of them can even be millimeter or centimeter scale uh, long. So you have to span this wide range of scales. Um, a lot of focus has been on the molecular ingredients of contractility, but at a coarse-grained level, uh, essentially one conceptual picture is to note that muscle is a soft, it has uh, some elastic compliance, it's active, of course, you can, uh, the motors consume chemical fuel to generate contractile forces, it's highly anisotropic. Uh, the slender fibers are very different uh, in, in along the axis versus across. Uh, and of course, the final point, which is all of these polymeric, uh, this polymeric matrix is immersed in cytosol, which is essentially largely water. Um, and so this coarse grained picture is what I want you to have in mind. And so essentially I want to think about the, uh, I want to think about a coarse grained mesoscale description of muscle fibers as an active sponge. And that's what I mean by a wet active solid. Um, and so immediately this picture suggests a problem if I have to, uh, contract rapidly. So if you want to contract a large fluid filled fiber uh, rapidly, you cannot do that everywhere at the same time. You cannot do it globally. What you can do is you can contract locally. And as you contract locally, you squeeze fluid and redistribute it internally, internal to the fiber. But that is a process that takes time. And so the hypothesis is that um, in very, very rapid uh, contractions of uh, muscle, potentially hydraulics, that is redistributions of fluid internal to the fiber, should potentially be rate limiting and we should account for it. And so the question is how do we do that? Um, and uh, what are the evidences for this? So can we get, uh, can we make sense of this uh, with the existing experimental evidence? Um, and so some of the consequences of such a coarse grain picture, as I already said, is that you cannot, you cannot have contractions that are global, but you can do it locally. So that means deformations must be spatially heterogeneous. You must have gradients. You, of course, have three-dimensional deformations. It's not just uh, a uniaxial system. And of course, uh, naturally, we, within this picture, we expect there should be fluid flow and fluid redistribution within the fiber. Um, and so what's the quantitative evidence for this? Of course, no one's really gone and measured fluid in contracting muscle fibers, and there's uh, even measuring spatially heterogeneous strains is, is possible, and there's some evidence for it, but it's quite hard. Uh, and so the state-of-the-art measurements uh, that we sort of reanalyzed from a number of different uh, uh, papers in the existing literature, uh, some of which are put up over here. So let me walk you through what's being plotted. So 
in a, in a variety of different organisms in various different uh, conditions, in vitro, ex vivo, in vivo, what not. The details are not important. Basically, if you think about an individual fiber, it's like a cylindrical, uh, you know, it's like a cylinder. Uh, there are two primary modes of uh, uh, deformation if you assume axis symmetry. One is changing the length, the other is changing the radius. Those are the two strains, so the radial strain, the axial strain, that's what's plotted on the two axes for all of these uh, examples. And what you are seeing is spontaneous oscillations of muscle fibers uh, are, are what are plotted as these curves. So as the uh, fiber is oscillating, uh, it generates both radial and axial strain, so three-dimensional defo three deformations. Um, and, and these are all local strains. Uh, and uh, as you oscillate, you, you traverse this curve. Now, the first thing to take away from all of these, uh, all of these experimental uh, data is that none of these deformations preserve local volume. They're not isochoric. Isochoric would mean that you sit on this black line, uh, but none of these deformations preserve local volume, suggesting that uh, you, this, this conceptual picture that I pointed out, that you have local contractions which squeeze and redistribute flow within the fiber is potentially relevant and is happening. Um, so that's the first piece of uh, sort of takeaway from here. The second is a point that I'll come back to at, the, at a later point in this talk, which is that uh, some of, in some conditions, not all, these uh, deformations cycles uh, enclose a non-zero area. And so you have strain cycles which are three-dimensional and they have a non-zero uh, area as you oscillate. That's something that'll be important at the end. Okay, so the local volume in these deformations is not conserved, suggesting that fluid flow internal to the cell should be important. So can we now, the task at hand is can we build a model that naturally captures this and explains this and, and demonstrates some consequences of having such um, hydraulic movements. Okay, um, and so the, for the, for, to do this, the framework that we use is of poor elasticity. So we use a two, uh, a, a mixture, a biphasic mixture-like model of a solid matrix, which is essentially to describe the uh, actin and, and the myosin polymer network, which has an elastic compliance, and, and the fluid part of it is just a Newtonian uh, fluid. The basic ingredients are, uh, or, are described over here. So globally, the whole system is in, you know, there's no inertia, you have force balance, there's an elastic stress for the solid part, the, the pressure is the only relevant uh, stress for the fluid. The flow of the fluid itself is given by Darcy's law, which, which captures the relative movement of the fluid relative to the solid, uh, is driven by pressure gradients on large scales. And of course, globally, the whole system is incompressible, even though the solid and the fluid independently are compressible because the solid is porous. Um, and so this is just a statement of mass conservation, because you have no exchange of material with the external world. And a key consequence of, of such a sponge-like description is that pressure in this material doesn't equilibrate instantly, even though inertia is negligible, um, and the sound speed is effectively infinite. Uh, pressure, in fact, takes some finite amount of time, and this is, it, it, it diffuses. And so there is a time scale which is given by the ratio of the viscosity to the elastic modulus, but there is a geometric parameter which can be very large, and this is the length scale over which fluid has to move relative to the pore size, which is the size through which the, what, uh, the fluid has to uh, permeate. And so this is the poroelastic or permeation time scale, which can be quite large, particularly because of this geometric and structural parameter. Um, and we want to include this physical feature into a model for muscle. Of course, all of this is passive. This is, you want meat. Uh, but if you make it active, then there's a new part to the elastic, uh, to the uh, a new stress in the solid matrix, which is an active stress. But the origin of the active stress is, of course, now uh, the, you have to think about the molecular kinetics of the myosin binding and unbinding from actin. So for that, we go down uh, scale, and we do a simple model of uh, binding kinetics of motors that bind and unbind with given rates. And when they bind, they generate forces, which generate the active stress. The details I won't go into, but just to flash, um, we have a kinetic equation uh, for the motor density, a corresponding equation that we can derive for the force generated by the motors when they bind. And all of this gets packaged into an anisotropic active stress, which generates not just axial contractile forces, but also radial contractile forces, simply because 
of the binding geometry of the motor. The motor binds at a given angle and can generate forces in both direction. And so there's two ingredients that are important that we include over here, which is pieces of biophysical feedback, uh, both of which are well known from single molecule experiments. One is that the binding rate of the motor onto actin decreases with the separation between the filaments. That makes sense. The probability of binding goes down as you separate the filaments further away. The second is that the unbinding rate uh, depends on the load on the motor. And so both of these are, are very generic pieces of feedback which we include in. And now we have a complete uh, model which connects the molecular kinetics to the mechanics and hydraulics of, at the fiber scale. What are the consequences of this? Um, what, one of the consequences is if the activity is large enough, then you obtain spontaneous oscillations which now in a cartoon form are exactly what I uh, suggested in, in a conceptual, uh, from the conceptual picture, which is you have active hydraulic oscillations. So if you have a spatial gradient of active stresses, wherein you have more myosin on one side, less on the other, you start contracting in a spatially inhomogeneous fashion. As you contract, you squeeze and you cause flow, you cause fluid to flow from one end to the other, this latter process happens on a time scale which is on this permeation or porolastic time scale. The feedback of the load dependence of the motor kinetics causes uh, further accumulation of uh, myosin in regions of distension, in regions of tension, causing contraction. And this, this feedback cycle coupling fluid flow to the recruitment uh, of myosin sustains in, a, in, a, in an oscillatory manner um, with two time scales, one being a kinetic time scale, which is the time scale it takes to build up active stresses, and the other being the time scale it takes to redistribute fluid within the fiber. And the, the product of the two, or the geometric mean of the two, is what dictates the oscillation frequency. Question? Yeah, so tau k is the is related to binding unbinding. Yes, oh, yes. Fine. Yeah, that, that's uh, why you can somehow get a high frequency. Yes, yes. So it's it's some packaged version of the binding and unbinding uh, rates. I'm not giving you the actual expressions, um, but it's a combination. It's not just the binding kinetics that yeah. dictates the uh, eventual contraction rates, but it's a combination of the binding kinetics and the porolastic time scale. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, you mean theta here? That's a fixed number. There's no dynamics for that. Yeah. Okay. So here, so that's, and, and because I said that generic contractions, uh, you know, typical contractions generically induce uh, fluid flow within the fiber, so you shouldn't be able to do better than such a, um, uh, you shouldn't be able to contract at a rate faster than such a frequency. And so if you compare to existing data, Here's a plot of the non-dimensional oscillation frequency for a variety of organisms, of different muscle types, and what is plotted on the x-axis is the ratio of these two time scales, which you can think of as a dumb Kohler number. On the blue end, the kinetics dominates, and there the frequency saturates, uh, whereas in the red end, where hydraulics dominates, you have uh, this uh, bound which is, uh, depends on the, which is exactly the same expression as before, which is geometric mean, and the important thing is that in examples where I said, such as an insect flight, where you have some of the fastest uh, muscle-driven movements, they all seem to sit in a regime where hydraulics does dominate, suggesting that to understand the biophysical limitations on uh, the rates of contractions of muscle in these very ultra-fast uh, situations, we have to think about the, the fluid dynamics internal to the fiber. Okay. Uh, and the second thing to point out is the range of this non-dimensional lumber uh, across various different organisms across the tree of life. So uh, suggesting there may be something interesting evolutionarily to think about uh, the structural and the mechanical properties of muscle fibers. Okay, uh, in the last five minutes, I want to quickly tell you about not dynamics, but mechanics. And so uh, we can take the same description of now, a, we have three-dimensional deformations of this wet, active, solid-like description for muscle, um, and we can just do linear response and ask what are the mechanical, uh, what is the mechanical response of such a material? In the simplest setting, we just, at linear elasticity, mechanics is quantified by a relation between a stress and a strain. Uh, 
course, now tensorial if you have deformations in different directions. In an energy conserving system, this matrix of moduli uh, is symmetric if you exchange the first and the last two indices. That's what is, uh, that's related to a well-known reciprocal relation, maxwell betty reciprocity in mechanics. Of course, muscle doesn't conserve energy, so when you break energy conservation, you don't have to satisfy this uh, equality, and that in recent years has been christened odd elasticity, and perhaps not surprisingly, muscle is also odd elastic, uh, and in the simplest, if you take the simplest uh, modes of deformation, an isotropic uh, stress and a shear stress with the corresponding strain, so an isotropic and a shear component for a strain given this uh, very anisotropic geometry of muscle fibers, you have a matrix of moduli, the diagonal ones are, are well known, that's just a bulk modulus and a, and a shear modulus or a Young's modulus. The off-diagonal elements can be different and the difference between the off-diagonal elements or the asymmetric part is zeta and that is the odd elastic or odd viscoelastic uh, contribution. The nice thing is we can obtain this zeta as a function of molecular and structural parameters from the model. Um, and, and the other point to make over here is that it naturally appears just with anisotropy. There's no chirality in the system to get odd elasticity. You just need an anisotropic, uh, spatially anisotropic active solid. And historical point, uh, this sort of um, is a non-symmetric um, elastic response or an odd response was in fact already noted in a paper by Zalak in 95 and 96, where he points out the breakdown of the major Cauchy symmetry uh, in the model for muscle, although it wasn't uh, taken up further later. Um, and so one of the major consequences of this non-reciprocal response is of course, work and energy production. Oh, that, um, oh sorry. Um, before I get to the work production part, um, what is the origin of the uh, odd elasticity is that even if you think at a single cross bridge level, you can show that the mechanical response of a cross bridge is uh, in an average sense non-reciprocal. And the simple understanding is that uh, because the binding, or the binding rate of the motor depends on the spacing between the filaments, the axial contraction depends on the radial stretch. And the, other, uh, and the radial force doesn't need to depend on the axial stretch in the same manner. And so in general, uh, the contractile force generated along the long axis uh, depends on the um, stretch, the separation between the filaments, and that is um, uh, already the non-reciprocal mechanical element at the microscopic scale, coarse grained up to the macro scale is what leads to the odd elastic response zeta. Um, consequence of the odd elasticity is that, as I said, if you have deformation cycles um, in two directions and you come back, you perform a cycle with non-zero area, then you can produce work. And the work is the product of the odd elastic modulus and the area you enclose in such a cycle. Um, and of course, we do see cycles, as I already showed you, particularly in physiologically relevant situations in, such as in flight. And so a natural question is, can we, uh, is this important and do muscles and do insects use odd elasticity to generate power to fly? That we don't quite know yet because one point is the odd modulus is not measured, but can we estimate it? And so to estimate it, what we do is um, compare our model to uh, existing measurements of rheology of muscle fibers in 1D and um, the details, again, I won't go into, but in 1D, in terms of uniaxial deformations, um, we can fit for essentially, uh, this is a, as a function of frequency, the in-phase part, uh, and so you get a complex modulus, you can fit for the in-phase uh, stiffness, which is like a Young's modulus, and the, uh, the outer phase part, like a viscous modulus, and use the parameters from such a fit. The lines are fits to the data, the data are dots, uh, you can use these parameters from the fit to estimate within the model what the odd elastic modulus should be, and that's what's shown in blue. Uh, first thing to note is that it's non-zero, and the second thing to note is that it's largely negative. Um, and a negative modulus uh, times a negative hind area in such a work cycle is a positive amount of work production, and in this convention, work produced uh, a, a is 
um, positive. Uh, and so, you know, this is just suggestive that there may be some benefit and use of using odd elastic, particularly three-dimensional deformations of muscle fibers um, to generate work in physiologically relevant settings. Um, and so the main takeaway is that um, that's a new mode of producing work. There is another mode of producing work which has been thought of and, and studied a fair bit, which is a negative viscosity, but I won't go, I think, go into that further. And so to conclude, um, basically uh, what I, you know, just to summarize quickly, is that a coarse-grained picture of thinking of muscle fibers as a soft, wet, active solid is potentially uh, a useful and relevant uh, picture if you want to think about the range and limits of its uh, performance, both in terms of rates of contraction and also its uh, power generation and work production. And there's many questions in terms of, uh, given that the ingredients, the nitromyosin and the fluid environment, they're all very generic to many, many cells. Perhaps there's a broader uh, category of um, other biological cells or tissues in which similar ideas may appear. Fly. And very quickly, I want to put an advertisement, which is I've, as I've just moved to the University of Michigan uh, in the last two months ago um, as, a, as a new faculty, as an incoming faculty member in physics. And um, so I've just started my group, and we work on a variety of different problems in active matter control, soft mechanics, and biology. Um, and so we're, we're looking for uh, graduate students to join. So if you know, or if you are a graduate student who's interested, uh, or if you're a student who's interested to do, um, to work on some of these problems, then please write to me. Um, and so let me put back the uh, summary slide and take questions. Thank you. Questions? Kinetics versus hydraulics. Yes. Uh, so there seems to be some correlation, at least from the pictures that you showed, that the smaller sized organisms use hydraulics and the bigger ones use kinetics. Is that something that you can say in general? So, um, yeah, th there is a trend in which, um, so the small organ smaller organisms, do you ha they have a larger frequency of um, operation. Now, um, it's likely that hydraulics is more, uh, is okay in, in a smaller organism simply because uh, the hydraulic timescales depends on the size of the fiber and in a smaller organism, the fibers are smaller uh, and in a larger organism, fluid flow is just way too slow. So you then you, you um, change the microstructural features um, sort of evolutionarily so that these organisms work in a regime where kinetics is okay and then you don't have to, you're not limited and constrained by um, the fluid flow. And but um, the a good a test for this would be if we can manipulate, uh, you know, within say Drosophila, change the uh, the uh, spacing between filaments and the pore size, uh, or the or change the fiber length and see if there is a change in the oscillation frequency. We have not done that, and I, but if anyone has ideas, um, then then that would be a test, right, for asking if there is actually. Um, what is the scaling with size? Yeah. Yeah. Naive question. Maybe connections to Kleiber's law would be very interesting. Kleiber, yes. Uh, in terms of metabolic scaling, I do not know how directly to connect to metabolic scaling because, of course, in all of this, uh, I've assumed that um, there's other other things that can constrain speed, right? You know, metabolic requirements, uh, and neural signaling, whatnot. Um, so we've assumed that uh, oxygen for instance, and, and ATP fuel is available in plenty. Um, and I, yeah, I don't know if there's, I, I don't know a direct way to connect it to Cliveless, uh, but if you have ideas, I would be interested in hearing. Yeah. Globally, yes, yes. It's certain pressures, of course, you will uh, open water channels and yes. things like that. So, yes. so how, how would that begin to, I mean, and, and the, the, I mean, it's not inconceivable that you will have uh, these squeezing pressures that you have. 
water channels opening up. Yes, so, yeah. So uh, aquaporins yeah. and whatnot right, can right. open and then eventually regulate the uh, water and. Uh, um, right, and that could I, be quite local as well. So you will. Yes. I mean, yeah. But usually that. Uh, uh, because we were focusing on very rapid uh, movements on the millisecond or you know, second time scales, uh, those processes are much slower, and uh, and that's why we neglect that. Uh, and so we assume that the membrane is impermeable on the time scales. Um, and of course, so this is this is one limit. And and if you allow for permeation across the the membrane, which is what uh, I, uh, water channels will let you do, then you you will be able to cross. Uh, simply because now if you permeate the membrane sufficiently, then um, you just squeeze the water out and, uh, and then you, you, can, you can just, you, you don't, you're not limited by, by having to redistribute fluid within a confined space. Um, so yes, uh, but at least within the regimes of the examples that we were thinking of, um, that doesn't seem to be the constraining uh, feature. Of course, on very long time scales with exercise and stuff, you do have, um, uh, Increase in volume and hydration of muscle cells. Okay. Okay. So yeah, that that would be interesting to. Uh, I would be curious to know more about that. But at least in in the muscle context, we didn't find. But there could be interesting um, osmoregulatory uh, aspects on fast time scales as well. Thank you. In the literature on muscles, there is this old law, which is called Hill's law, which relates the force to, by which you pull to the velocity of pulling. Yes. Uh, which is, I think, consistent with any of the molecular motors, including the one that you use. Is there a regime where this would be satisfied in your calculations, or where, in which limit should I find that? Back? I guess hydraulics is simple to me. Yeah, yeah. If you if you throw away hydraulics, so actually the the uh, just the kinetic model. Will if you if you assume a steady um, a steady speed of uh, motion, then you will reproduce you hills. Reproduce this. Yes, yes. In fact, the kinetic <laughs> model is very related to models that uh, y'all have used uh, yeah. before uh, in to just model uh, single filaments with motors yeah. on them. Merci. Yes. Oh, oh, we are very slow, so we are somewhere here. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. If there is no other question, next time we will see you. Thank you. Take care, Mr. Okay.